Hi. Uh, I used to be a teacher for five years. So I have written everything down to control myself. <laughs> let me tell you, let me start by telling you the story. It's a Sufi story. This master called his servant in and he said, I want you to go to the marketplace and buy me one pound of sugar, the purest and the whitest, and also one pound of salt, the whitest and the purest. And he gave him a plate. But he said, remember my loyal servant, the key word is separation. The servant went to the marketplace and asked for one pound of sugar, and the man brought it. Then he asked for one pound of salt, the man brought it, he said, where can I put it? He flipped the plate. He said, put it here. He came back home. He said, this was the sugar, and this is the salt. <laughs> the key word was separation. But in public art, separation does not operate. You have to include everyone and every ideas. I have been a public artist since 1960s. What I would like to talk to you is about, I'm going to talk not more than 20 minutes. Then I will show you very, very few examples of my work. And then we will have a period of questions and answers, which I'm looking forward to it. As long as the questions are easy. Like, <laughs> how do you pronounce your name? <laughs> Sixty years after the American Revolution, Emerson, the great American philosophers, gave three lectures at Harvard University. In totality, in combination, they called them, it was called the American Scholar. In this series of lectures, he tried to establish a common, grand common culture to include the rich and the poor, the high culture and low culture. And the question was, to his mind, what constitutes art in America? Toward the end of 19th century, a group of European artists, architects, musicians, designers, poets, they also put a group together. They called themselves cessationists. They were from Holland, from France, from Germany, from Austria. And for that, Rodin was one of those participants in this movement. As you look back in history, every 50, 60 years, a group of artists, they believe in this hallucination that public art could survive and benefit people. From the very beginning, we did not have very much support, but there is something about the American Constitution that encourages in this foolish practice. What is public? Everything which is in the public, everything which is deprivatized and set in the public space. The non-public expresses the totality of the work, life, buildings, streets, factories, offices, drugstores, around which people live and work. The relationship between architecture and art and landscape architecture exists. There is a relationship that exists between these three because they're all in public places. Being in public place makes the relationship possible. Public sculpture and architecture have same history, have different histories, different languages, and different sensibility. They coexist. Because that in the 60s, architects became very uneasy. That was their domain, and we were interfering with their domain. What is public art? 
Public art is not about self, but others. It is not about personal taste, but the needs of others. It is not about the angst of the artist, but the happiness and well-being of others. It is not about the myth of the artist, but it is about its civicness. It is not to make people feel diminished and insignificant, but it is to glorify them. It is not about the gap between culture and public, but it is to make art public and art is citizen again. Public art is not mass art. It's not Nazi art or Stalinist art. It is not Hegelian, this uh, German 19th century philosopher, Hegel, believed that at any given time in history, you have a forces called thesis and another group of forces they are called antithesis. And these two forces collide and create a synthesis that any time in history there is one absolute and everything is judged accordingly. In, after the end of the Second World War, the American critical writers adhered and believed very strongly in Hegel especially those people who were encouraging modern art, that they believed that at that time, <coughs> since 1945, until its demise in 90s, there were one absolute, and that absolute was abstract expressionism. Any deviation from that was just an episode, unimportant. But I substitute Paul Tillich. He's a existentialist Christian theologian who saw history horizontally. Hegel was vertical, he's horizontal. It means that at any given time in history, there are many forces, there are many view of po point of views, many disciplines that they live together. And in the process of living and practicing it, they create a new beginning. That is why I adhere to, and I tried from late 60 to encourage my fellow artists to believe in the same thing, but they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. The word in public art does not mean large works of art in large public spaces. The critical condition in which art finds itself in the social context, another ingredient of public art, it is the social content. Has encouraged some artists to become public rather than private, and civic rather than in-studio artists. Public sculptures makes the artist, the arts accessible to the people. The art in public art is not a genteel art, but a missionary art. In public art, culture and social needs should define the artistic practice. So when you are an artist, the definition comes from being a public. The definition places the artist as a maker in the center of cultural and social activities. Therefore, the artist as a maker first has a place in the society, uh, especially in America, it's very important because they ask you, what do you do? You say, I'm an artist. You say, no, I know, but what do you do? <laughs> so being a public artist will answer that question. And the other one is, it is not practicing artistic creation, but rather it is practicing artistic production based upon cultural and social needs. So you're an artist because there is a need for you. You know, I, I was in Europe, this is a few years back, and the, the curator of the show and the contractor, they were there to meet up with me to define the work and how to do it and when to do it. The curators asked me, would I mind to wait a few more minutes because an important 
collector is coming and he was trying to raise some money from some of the art project that he had. So this very, very big man, physically very big, he came out of this car, the driver and the curator gently but firmly pushed him between a tree and a bench so he can sit in a bench. And he sat and his legs were open and the tree, the tree trunk right in the middle of his legs. And after a few minutes, smile appeared on his face, which makes the curator very happy. And he got up and he said, I felt my physicality. And after that, he left the park and went home. His home, he had his own estate, his own river, his own mountain. And the only time he felt his physicality was the next morning when the valet helped him to put on his jacket. But who uses the public spaces, public park? People who work in the most congested work environment, live in the most congested apartments, ride on the most congested subways or buses. And the last thing they worry about is to feel their physicality. They like to stretch their arms, jump up and down, and enjoy the space. And that man never came back to that park. You know, when Central Park, you all have been in New York or heard about it. <laughs> Central Park, when it was established, it became a platform for democracy. And the first few years, there were more policemen there than ordinary people. Because for the first time, the very rich and the very poor, they had a shared space. And some of the workers did not know how to behave in a public situation, nor some of the rich. But eventually, they all enjoyed it. And the, this Central Park is the heartbeat of New York. It's a grand station of life. It's the most beautiful part of New York, and the most friendly, and the most enjoyable. Public art depends upon some interplay with the public based on, upon some shared assumptions. Public art should not intimidate, assault, or control the public. It should be neighborly. All, all of the philosophers and all of the critical writers, except the very few, have neglected to develop the concept of public space. And, and, and you can look it up. You don't have to take my word for it. You look at all the philosophers of 19th, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, there are very, very few who address the issue of public space. Those few who have written in the, on the concept of public space are Walter Benjamin. You know, Walter ben Benjamin is a very important critical writer. And, and, I, and I know you have the translation of it in English and in L London. The book are very thick and is very impressive. You don't have to read it. You just hang on to it and walk on the street. People will be impressed. <laughs> the other one is Walter Benjamin. The other one, Henry Lefebvre, is a French critical writer, and Frederick Jameson, American one. Public art has social functions. It has moved from large-scale, site-specific art into work with social content. I continuously refer to this social content because that is that's the essence of my work. Its language is a hybrid of the social sciences, art, architecture, and public art believes that the modernist culture has left the people and has lost its connection to all of the arts. And only in a newly formed relationship with a non-art audience and those who are not here. Well, that's for that's life, okay. <laughs>
the non-art audience is the people who are not at the table. Public sculpture <coughs> tries to demystify the creative act. Public art is not art in public places. Some wish to put art here and there. Others wish to make here and there. The former is called art in public places, and latter is public art. We should move from the closed artistic creation to the open public production of a space. We ought to minimize our loyalty to art as a distinct and separate discipline in order to become the custodian of all the arts for all the people. As I told you, it's an illusion, but bear with me. Okay. Public sculpture has annexed a new territory for sculpture that extends its field for social, cultural, and political experience. We could begin a search for a cultural history by calling for a structural unity between the art object and its social setting. This uh, cultural history is very important. And there are many critical writers who have written books on culture, cultural history. And when, when you have extra time and nothing else to do, please look it up. It's very interesting. Public sculpture, I hope you don't mind, because I used to be a teacher. You know, I said, do that, do that. Okay. <laughs> Public sculpture should reject the idea of the universality of art. That's another important point. It has always been encouraged that art is universal. We, we are against that concept. Reject the idea of the universality of art and assert that culture is detectable geographically and the idea of region is understood as a term of value. So it means if you're living in South London, it means something and you should pay attention to it. Or if you live in Bronx in New York, you should look at it again. The context of culture and life and use is always implicit when anything is made. It is difficult to separate one context from another, for each context conceals the other and each has its own shadowy side. Context is not a visual index. It is anthropology. A compatible methodology, context is not a spatial boundary. Context is a thing, like a jar is a thing, which gathers and unites. Like a, you have a jar of milk, the jar gathers and keeps the milk in that place, and it's upright. Context is partly always empty and partly to be filled in. Emptiness is a state of being. You know, when you come through this, to this room, there is a space before the door and a space after the door, which is totally empty. It is because so the door can function. So that emptiness there is no negation. There is no negation in that space. It's complete, fulfilled. Smile. Why are you so serious? <laughs> At least you can pretend. <laughs> <laughs> Once in a while, I appreciate a smile, faint sign. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you. Like, okay. Context never shapes pure space as it would in geometry. Generally speaking, public sculpture is not a particular style or ideology. That is why it is a serious mistake to present one specific model of public sculpture. At best, we may have a general view based upon our knowledge of particular work at particular time. 
the way art has historically been viewed since the 18th century. 18th century is a very, very important period in the development of art, especially of the Kantian philosopher. Because of, uh, of the 18th century is the result of the philosophical tradition of the Kantian view of art. Immanuel Kant says he's a very big shot in philosophy, you know, very important. He says, since art has no function which it could perform better than anything else, then art could only be defined as being beyond use, useless. Kantian philosophers believe that art is good because it's useless. We, means public artists, believe art is good because it's useful and serves some social function. Although Immanuel Kant gave art its independence, sovereignty, autonomy, and freed artists, most importantly, freed artists from monarchy and church. Nevertheless, at the beginning of the 21st century, there is no sign of any attempt to fill in the great gap between law and high culture. His theory of disinterest is, in Kant philosophy, this idea of disinterest is a bulk of his argument. I'm going to spare you. First of all, I don't understand it completely. <laughs> okay. He has left, the theory of disinterest has left the people forsaken and isolated them from being part of one great culture. Our aim is to create this one great culture. From the 18th century up to the present time, all the philosophers and all of the critical writers, except the very few, have declared a permanent separation between art and life. And since everything is not cultural, as you know, since mid-60s, all the social issues in America have become cultural issues. For instance, women's right to bear child or abortion is called cultural. And this takes a long history between a very, very conservative group of Americans and very, very far left group of Americans. And since everything is not cultural, then we should ask what Frederick Jameson has already asked. What is the political function of culture when everything is cultural? You know, I was doing a piece in Staten Island, and a, a, a woman was sitting next to my left. And she started talking about the right of abortion. And I said, we're not talking abortion. She said, I know that. I love your art. But you see that lady on the other side? She's against abortion. So when you go to this social meeting, as I told you at the beginning, all social issues, all political issues, all cultural issues are on the table. Public art is mediation. Without mediation, public art has no value. Mediation makes neighborly spaces by shaping it and drawing it to a user's attention to the larger context of life. That means public art should be part of life and not an end in itself. Public art should embrace buildings, street, and ornament and all of other people. It should make room for poetry and all of the other arts. So in public art, we believe very strongly about public poetry, which is very, because of rap music, has developed in this public poetry and has become very strong movement in America. That people get up and recite their poetry. Ornament has no significance of its own. Ornament has a unique function. 
It stands for something. Ornament belongs to the buildings. The fact is that the idea of craft, ornament, function in art needs reconstructing. It has to be freed from its oppositional relationship to the concept of art. As you know, craft has always kept from art. It's a art and craft. Public art must free itself from art education and its pedagogies and become art for all of the people. Pedagogies like art are self-exploration and self-expression. I hate that. As soon as somebody says I'm trying to express myself, I have to take a bus. <laughs> Some time ago in the subway, I saw two young men. It's anecdotal. High school age. Sitting across from me, back from a field trip, that school taking him out. One had a brochure in his hand. It was on Impressionism. The young man opened it up and pointed at picture of Van Gogh's bedroom. He said to his friend, look at his, he has his own room. He has his own bed. He has his own pillow. He has his own blanket. Look at the chair. Look at the window. Look at all those trees. He said, and the teacher said, he was poor. The friend rolled his eyes and looked out. Education in cultural institution is not much better, except here at Parasol. It is a, no, no, it's a, it's a very serious business. Very serious business. Everything is reduced to school buses and turnstiles. Serious study of educational experience and lesson of art are suspended. John Dewey said, he's uh, my hero, uh, American philo social socialist philo philosopher and educator. John Dewey said, a work of art elicits and accentuates this quality of being a whole and belonging to the larger, all-inclusive whole, which is the universe in which we live. Democracy is participation in ruling and governing. Democracy is participation in power. And the artist should listen to that. You should participate in the power. We must come to believe that democracy is not the lowest common denominator, and people are not always right. Artistic relationship must exist between the artist and the public. A vigorous discourse is needed to sway the public from personal needs and taste to greater common needs. Public art is not fiction. Panacea, social work, physical therapy, ice cream social, or developers' community planning scheme. Stay away from them. We must leave public, we must leave private for public. We must leave esoteric for exoteric. We must leave metaphysic for anthropology. We must leave heroic and bombastic for the common and the ordinary. We must leave the antique and the future for the present. We should leave myth for allegory. We should leave metaphysics for poetry. The essential language of being is poetry. It is the language of secular and non-sectarian theology. Forget about this sectarian business. The poetry of our time, which is open, points at the present. Poetry is a systematic rejection of all logic and all reason. Melovich, the Russian constructivist, said on February 14, 1914, at a public re lecture, I rejected reason. When I was teaching, students asked me a tough question. 
I would use that quotation. Poetry is a systematic rejection of all logic and all reason. We can simply accept poetry as it exists and turn away from questioning it and move toward life and everyday life. The questioning of public art needs the poetic language because when it came to the critical writer, writing about art, that was our, our savior. We, we rejected the language, the common language that art critic and art criticism uses. We needed a poetic language. The future of public art in America is the future of American cities. Public art believes in the city and its orthodoxy. Public space is always political and public art is always predisposed to it, to politics. Public sculpture believes that something else outside of sight, you are the, uh, or the artist know, S-I-T-E. Public sculpture believes that something else outside of sight explains why the sight becomes to what sight is, just like gravitational force, okay? The, the object that you make has its own force of location. Finally, public art is a logical extension of modern movement. Now, I'll show you some of the work and then we get to, and then you ask questions. Okay, this is a, uh, some of the dates I know, some of I don't, and these are not in order. Uh, this is a tree, a bridge over a tree. 1970. 1970. <laughs> this is a, a reading house, a Lake Placid, in 1980. 1980. This was for the, it, it looks a little bit eccentric. And the reason is I didn't have money to bring light, to f have fixture, light fixture inside of the building. So he made, we build the furniture first, then they put the wall on. That's why it looks eccentric. Okay. This is inside. This is a meeting garden. There is a quotation here by John Dewey, and he says, as long as art is the beauty parlor of civilization, neither art nor civilization survives. Beautiful, right? How about the smile? <laughs> Next. You are very serious. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> this is a lecture room for Louis Kahn. He, he was an American, important American architect. And on the floor, there is a quotation by Walt Whitman. And he says, the best architect is the one who makes himself less than people. And uh, the, these are the shutters. And the reason this architect who was building this room could not decide the size of the window. So every other day we'll change it, make it bigger and smaller. So I made the shutter bigger. So no matter what it does, it will f function. Okay, and this is a, a platform. Uh, and that drawing you see on the wall, Mrs. Khan came to the opening and went back home and brought the drawing framed and put it there. You know, you know about Louis Khan having two wives and they, they lived a couple of houses from each other. And nobody knew it until he died, and one of the sons discovered that. <laughs> Fantastic guy, I'm managing <laughs> it. You know, in, I, in 2005, I was in Iran, and when I said that, the women in the audience stood up and clapped. <laughs> Honest, standing ovation. <laughs> for Louis Kahn <laughs> to be so discreet and respectful. Okay, this is the other view. This is the other view of the... Uh, 
And you see those, uh, those drawings, or Louis Kahn's drawings, and I made those special places so they could hang it. This is part of Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania. They have all his, uh, Louis Kahn's uh, documents, pictures, buildings, everything in that. This is a picnic garden. I did it in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The whole budget for the whole thing was $6,000. So the hamburger looks green because of the, this corrugated, <coughs> green corrugated material I used. This is a poetry room. I don't know where. Uh, I'm sorry. LA. LA, okay. And all the poems here, here, over there is from Robert Frost. And at the time I was doing this, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, Scott Burton, first-rate public artist, he said, see, oh, you're very lucky you're doing Robert Frost in, in Los Angeles. In New York, they would have killed you. Okay. <laughs> this, this is a, a bridge in uh, Minneapolis. It is uh, it's, uh, run across 30, 16 lanes of highway. It's about uh, in meter 175, something like that. And I use this uh, yellow and this baby blue. And the director of the museum hated it, hated the color. So the day they were painting it, he asked me to come to the museum and try to persuade me from 7 o'clock until 6 o'clock at night. And I told Martin, I have given you the color scheme from the way long time ago. So finally his wife came, said, Martin, leave him alone. Let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day, Martin sent a huge bouquet of flowers to our house. This is, uh, this is Battery Park uh, in New York City. Uh, this is 3.5 acres of land. Uh, this is the Hudson River. Okay. And these poetry, uh, the poems are from Walt Whitman and Frank O'Hara. Frank O'Hara is a great New York poet. This is a, uh, you know, there is a huge company here German. There is a huge company here, and in Minnesota, you have never been there. Don't come. It's very, very cold. <laughs> you know, the first day I was in America, I actually cried. <laughs> it was so cold. It gets about 20, 30 below zero. So people park their car here and get on these 13 consecutive bridges, and they come to work. And Two sections of this walkway intersect. And uh, you know, this landscaping was an in-house job. And this guy came to me, he said, he was an engineer at this company. He said, Sia, do you think I can design the, the shrubbery and trees and things? I said, sure. And he did a fantastic job. This is a bandstand uh, in Mitchell, South Dakota. This is a Sacco Vanzati reading room. Sacco Vanzati, there were two anarchists, Italian immigrants, they came to America and they were executed in 1927. And I have done four reading rooms for them. By the way, you know the, this uh, reading room I have done downstairs? There is a pencil, you should take one, okay? There is a Beautiful orange pencil. I'm taking the yes. Okay. I'm zeroing on you. My pleasure. Okay. This is a, this is a poetry, so take my word for it. It's fine. Next time. <laughs> and I use uh, Wallace Stevens, a poet, wrote a poem. It's called Anecdote of a Jar. He was once in Tennessee. He comes upon a piece of landscape, and everything is disorganized and disarray. He has a fruit jar in his hand, and I don't know why. He penetrates this piece of landscape, 
and puts this jar in non-geometric geometric center of this piece of land. And everything gathers around the jar and becomes a unified whole. So the transmutation takes from organic to organized. But the last stanza of the poem bemoans of the problem that the jar never became Tennessee. And this is the pain that I always experience at the end of my work, that the peace never becomes part of the city, except those bridges. They always stay separate, and I don't know what it is. Well, this is a, a, a bridge for two anarchists, and this is a, a, a bridge from the first floor to the second floor of a Stuttgart. Stuttgart. This is a, a huge park, and this is a huge. This uh, this museum has has an art school Indeed. adjacent to it. So students who live on the campus, they use this table. It's about 20, 30 feet long. They have their breakfast there. And this, uh, these furniture here, they all have a wheel on it. And I got that from a postcard from England. Uh, Simon Beeson, he's not here tonight. Simon Beeson was helping me. And he gave me this postcard. For the gardener, rather than lifting the whole bench, he picks it up and moves it around. And so in, in uh, this garden, student or other people can move the bench and put it where the sun is or shade. Olympic. Oh, that's the Olympic. Uh, <laughs> 1996. Right. 19, Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, that's it right there. Okay, this is a, a post office park across from a small town in Minnesota, across from a post office. So people pick up their mail and they come and sit in the park. In America, people do not sit on the benches in the park. They immediately refer to as bum. So <laughs> all, the, all the parks except uh, in Manhattan, it's empty. People walk around, but they never sit down. <laughs> Next. This is the opening into, a, into this garden. And I use this uh, medieval uh, device of making the space deep. So the fences on the back are about eight inches shorter than the uh, benches in front. And this jar here, I don't know, uh, Simon calculated that. So it, it appears to be smaller, but it is smaller. So help the, <laughs> to expand the space, please. Uh, this is a, a bridge and a light Staten Island. Staten Island in New York. And this is a, a fishing bridge. This is over Rock River in uh, Wisconsin. It's over 750 feet long. And uh, right on the railing, we have electricity. So people go fishing. They can fry their fish and enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> this, this bridge, it, it is between the rich people and the poor people. And they meet here together. This is a top view of it. And that locomotive, there was a company in Lloyd, that's where it is. They used to make these trains pieces. And I, I copied one of them out of aluminum because they're very, very heavy. So, and this young woman got a ladder. They brought a ladder, I don't know why. And she went up there, and she touched, and she cried because her father or her grandfather used to work on this factory, which doesn't exist anymore. This is a, a Leipzig. And in the, in the center of it, for the support system, I have these jars. You know, these uh, buildings that the Russian built, they're not strong enough to hold a bridge. So you needed a, to augment the support in the middle of it. 
it, it was a, such a sad, depressing. It was right after the, the communists left. It was so depressive and so poverty ridden. I mean, the whole town. And they would look at your shoes. And I asked my friend who was showing me around, I said, why are they looking at our shoes? He said, well, look at their shoes. This is a bridge in Iowa City, Iowa. Iowa is the heartland of America. They are 99.9% uh, .9 voted for Ronald Reagan. And he's not my favorite one. So. <laughs> and uh, when I presented that, uh, well, forget it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, it connects the biology building. Yes. The new biology to the old biology building. And this is inside of the, the bridge. And this po poem is from Walt Whitman. But honestly, I, I don't remember what. This is a picnic table for the, uh, where, honey? Huesca, Spain. Huesca, Spain. Uh, that was the, when uh, Franco, that horrible dictator who, who killed for fun of it. Uh, this city was the only scapegoat for the people to go to France. And this picnic table is 50 feet by 50 feet. And Garcia Lorca, do you know Garcia Lorca? Beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. And there are four of these. <coughs> he used to do drawings, Garcia Lorca. And so I selected four drawings of him, and they etched it in the glass. And I asked fourth grader in Spain to select a poem. And then at the opening, th this town had only 400, 400 people. Everybody was invited. So the whole table was filled with food, layers and layers. And this kid, they stood around and read poetry. And everybody was crying. It was, and when we left, Barbie said, like, do movie director? Like a Fellini movie. Fellini movie. The car moved away, and they were putting their hands on the car to kiss him. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. So finally, everybody cried. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a glass room for an exile. Uh, this is a, a, a bridge in Strasbourg. This is a glass bridge. Uh, it's, n it's not very uh, big. It's not very big. It's in Nashville, Tennessee. You know, 500 years ago in Venice, they were trying to make a glass bridge. But at that time, 15th century, they couldn't make it together. And I did it. <laughs> Tell your friends. <laughs> this is for Fallujah. You know, uh, uh, you know Picasso's Guernica? I actually copied that. You know that eye he has in the painting? And in Guernica, he has a large life-size horse. I use a rocking chair. Yeah. <coughs> Fallujah. This is a floating poetry room for Amsterdam. And, uh, and I'm very proud of this, because Dutch are very, very stingy. Are you, any of you Dutch? <laughs> oh, they are. Incredible. And then a friend of mine who's from France, he gave me a quotation that Iranian ambassador said, be aware of the Dutch. They're the cheapest human being on the face of the earth. <laughs> so I commissioned this Dutch poet for $15,000. And what a fight. And I told him, I said, either you do it or I'm leaving. And he, can you, any of you read Dutch? Nobody knows. Anyhow. So he, <laughs> So he, uh, he did this poetry. <coughs> and here, 
there is a boat, there is a ship here, which we took the perspective as though when you're it's right on the water, you think it's a real ship. This is a, a parlor for Emerson, and this is a, 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 a quotation by him. This is the room I, I did for Mamco in Geneva, Geneva. And uh, this dictionary for building, you saw some of the models. Uh, there is 162 of them. And this room was designed for them. And uh, Christian Bernard told me, he said, I don't know why it is, but young students, when they come, they all sleep on the floor. So I made this bed. This is the, uh, you saw it downstairs, Edgar Allan Poe, study of Edgar Allan Poe. This is a, a exile, it's supposedly me, here, dreaming of Saint Adorno. You know, Jean Poursard wrote a book on Jean Genet and called it Saint Genet. And I said, Saint Adorno. <laughs> and uh, these, these pieces here and here, that's from Giacometti, Palace at 3 o'clock. Yeah. Copycat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is uh, Sokko Vanzati tomb. This is the last series of my work. I'm doing a, a series of tombs for those people who have influenced me, mostly philosophers and poets. And downstairs, there is a tomb for Nima, who's a great Persian poet. And this is for Sacco and Vanzati. This is a tomb downstairs this year, Nima. This is a Heidegger, tomb for Heidegger. Oh, this is John Berryman. He was a poet, and he committed suicide. He stood on the bridge, and a policeman was 10 feet away from him. And he carried a very normal chit chat with him, then he tipped his hat and jumped. But a year before he committed suicide, he told his student that he wanted to be buried on, on Lake Street. This is a very, very long street in part of Minnesota that all new immigrants, they move there. Every 10 years it changes, and he wanted to be buried there. But of course the city did not allow it, so I made it. I made this is his tomb there. Yeah. This is uh, Walt Whitman. That's it? Fantastic. No, please ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, would like, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Ziba Ardalan, who is the director and curator of Parasol. She invited me to show. She came to Minneapolis twice. She selected every single piece. She put it, she organized it, and she made the exhibition, and also she produced the catalog. <coughs> and I'm very grateful to her. And, and she has a special group of human beings who work with her. Please. Because it never gets where you want it to be. Where do you want it to be? I really don't know. I really don't know. <coughs> it's very elusive. You know, uh, the whole definition of art, the whole definition of people, it is a state of flux. So, there is some degree of idealism in it, being a public artist. But the reality of life contradicts that. So you are always in a state of flux and uncertainty. I, I never made any piece that gave me solace. 
Yes, sir. Another question? Over there. Please. Um, hi, I'm I just want to s ask you, uh, try to pin you down on this concept of poetry. Try. <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in public art. Uh -huh. um, so do you mean something a little bit more towards the structure has some kind of poetical essence or meaning that it gets captured? Because most of your work are, can actually be quite playful. Um, or is it like you have a lot of poetry reading rooms where it's actually the actual poetry right. which is being consumed right. by people? Right. Um, so how is poetry, or is it just purely you define poetry, if you like, logically, as rejection of logic or reason, and then whatever comes out of that is poetry? Um, is it, I mean, how, how, do, you, how you know, do you explain it to yourself? Okay. You know, uh, <coughs> to find, to discover a sign that could embrace everyone, it's, it is impossible. I use poetry because this is the only chance I have to invite people to stay with my work. And, and, I, and I grew up memorizing poetry all my life in Iran. So I have a special love and affection for poetry. Secondly, I love the ambiguity of poetry. So I use it as a series of semiology, uh, different studies of different signs and symbols. And sometimes it succeeds, and many times it fails. It's, it's a very, very 50-50 proposition. Yeah, but you don't try to be, sorry, just, just <coughs> go, go ahead. you don't try to be um, particularly, if you like, spiritual or deep about the usage of poetry in your work. It's actually quite easily consumable by normal people. You don't try to symbolize or right. ever symbolize. I do not, I um, do not. And that is quite refreshing. Right. Uh, considering that it stems from something which is symbolic. Right, I do not, I do not like, I do not like to preach I do not like to teach. I do not like to intimidate. I do not like to assault. I do not like to control people. I just put it there. It's like somebody put a color blue or yellow, and I put poetry there. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, um, in projects like Battery Park City, yes. your confederate was space in which your work would be placed. With say, that, say that again. In Battery Park City, when uh -huh. your work was uh -huh. to be placed with uh -huh work of other artists, right, right. how does that influence, or how do you create that dialogue, or how does that process work? No, in Battery Park, they divided the space. The space that they are given to us was only us. Okay. We did not have to compete. Secondly, this sense of collaboration is oversold. It never works. Mm -hmm. uh, I collaborated with a very close friend of mine, who have the same sensibility like me and same belief like me. I was a little more radical than he was, but nevertheless. So there was a mutual trust among us. So that made it possible. Even that, we had many fights, many fights. Okay. Uh, I, I despise the word of collaboration because at one time, artists were encouraged to collaborate with architects. You, as an individual artist, go to the office of an architect who have 100 people working there. They are a publicity section of the business. They have photographers. They have a public relation. And you, as an artist, you have no power. And they also have the money. They have the control of the money. In Battery Park, thanks to Scott, we established that we have to have the control of the money. And that was Scott's idea. That, that's it. Yeah. Did I answer it? Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. you. I do I just wonder whether you could possibly expand a little bit more on this kind of idea of this relationship between, on the one hand, universality, that there isn't one. And then later on, you spoke about this idea, which kind of leads on from another question earlier on about the state of flux and a separateness that you have with your work. 
and I was really intrigued by that tension in your work. No, I, I gave a talk at MIT. In MIT, people do not look at things, they read it. <coughs> and I gave a lecture, and this kid at the end of the hall raised his hand and said, Mr. Armijani, you contradicted yourself 16 times. <laughs> Not so good at doing that. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Please. Also, um, you mentioned empty space and the importance yeah. of that. Right. Can you just let us know a little bit more about the philosophy behind empty space and the importance of that in your work? You should know how to find the difficult questions. Yeah. <laughs> you have to forgive me. <laughs> I really don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But what I know about emptiness is that it, there is no negation in it. There is no warning. It is complete in itself. And I think when you look at the urban landscape, there are many places, not by design, mostly by accident, that there, there is a space left for people to act, behave. And not only in art, you look for that. You know, great artists like Milovic, but also you find that desire in poet, in philosophers. But it's a very elusive condition. But it, uh, since he, what was your first name? Uh, Ali. Ali. Since Ali brought it up, Rumi, this is what he is hoping for, because he, found, he discovered by finding this emptiness, you invite God. You, you glorify yourself when that space exists of emptiness. And uh, you know, uh, there, is, there, is, there was a singer, uh, Janis Joplin, in the 60s. Toward the end of her career, she died very young. You could not decipher the words she was saying. It just became a sc scream. That's beautiful. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you mentioned that the, the bridges were used and more used than other objects yeah. and artworks yeah. that you did. Is it because of this, for the same contradiction, people think it is of high art and they don't dare to go there? or The bridges? No, the bri not the bridges, oh. because you said the bridges are, yeah. are used more yeah. often right. than right. other uh, it, okay, works right. Right. of public art. That's true. What, what, what That's do you true. think is the reason? Is that because it reaches sort of high art status, do you think? Or they, it's, they are intimidated uh, by you it? Know, do you think they are intimidated? I understand what you're saying. I, I tried in my work to use the most ordinary common material. Mm -hmm. And also my uh, approach is very common and ordinary. And as I told you, before every project gets inaugurated, you have to go to these meetings. They announce it in the newspaper, and folks come. And they all talk about life. And they need, then they expect to get something to, from the artwork. And the artwork is never strong to offer them that. So they always leave depressed and disappointed that art cannot provide that avenue of happiness that they're seeking for. And that, that's a problem with art. You know, at the beginning of 20th century, they believed that this modern movement would eradicate that problem and make people and art one unit. But it never happens. Uh, because many people are totally loyal to their needs. Totally loyal. To and everyone functions differently. And what they express is their taste. When they come to the meeting, they say, my grandmother liked green, so I hope you paint this piece green. Or my grandfather liked a spaghetti. Do that look like a spaghetti. So. Great. One yes. more question. Um, so I think basically um, I was just wondering, you mentioned we public artists. Uh -huh. We. Oh, we, we, we were referring to. We is two and a half people. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> she asked about how you felt about Oldenburg and Liechtenstein having oh. pieces that were. Oh, right, right. 
Well, they, they don't consider themselves a public artist. And uh, Oldenburg, I have a tremendous amount of respect, and I love his work and uh, his ideas, but he has taken a, a safer route by, going, by being a sculptor, sculptor and not a public artist. That is why we couldn't get too many people to join us. Yes. Just one bonus. I think Bahman had a question. Oh, please. Just a very uh, pra pragmatic question. Have you ever, uh, may I ask if you've ever please. rejected a request to build a bridge? Bridge? No. <laughs> bridge, no. But other things I have. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, Sia, for thank having you. being so <laughs> good. Thank you. Thank you.